It was 1952. I was waiting to be called up to serve two years conscription in the army. They'll have their work cut out, making a soldier of you, pipsqueak. I did my basic training with these boys. We're locked in. It's only for two years. This could be the beginning of a, a beautiful friendship. Order! Ah! Oh! As soon as you taught me how to do it, I'm gonna kill him. You are a pitiful bunch. We lived together in a barrack room, and the more they brutalized us and broke us down, the closer we got. You are all about to be posted to Korea. <laughs> Which is no laughing matter, I can assure you! A-R-S-E-S! Let's find some girls. Forget the unobtainable and take what's on offer. <laughs> We're in. Why are you not saluting the officer? Excuse saluting, sir. Hernia. So, well, are we talking about like this? And, uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, that's How's perfect. That sound? It sounds really good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Great. thank you. Well, it's, it's very nice to meet you. And you. And thanks, thanks for uh, making time in the schedule and, and doing this. It's such Pleasure. a – it's a, I don't get as many opportunities to talk to people with such a, an illustrious long career. Uh-huh. And, and it, so it's a little bit intimidating too, but it's also really gratifying to be able to talk about oh, with somebody oh, who's okay. been doing it for as long as you have. Well, let's get out of the way right away. Queen and Country, your new feature, which is a sequel uh, to Hope and Glory. Yeah. And it's out right now in New York City at the Film Forum. Is it, has it played already in, 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 let's say, the U.K. or Europe at all? It's uh, The only other country it's opened in so far is, is France. We opened in France on the 7th of January, which was uh, mm-hmm. the day of the terrorist attack. The Charlie Hebdo. So it was, the, it was yeah. a bit of a disaster in the sense that nobody went to the cinema to see anything that day or that week. Yeah. And... So anyway, picked up a ride in the following week. But. And they do go. So for, for French people not to show up at a John Borman movie means something really horrific had to have happened because those people love their movies. Yeah, yeah, I do pretty well over there. I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, And I think, you know, um, mm-hmm. the, um, this uh, marvelous guy, Pierre Rission, mm-hmm. who did the subtitles and... Um, uh, watching it with a French audience, <clears throat> I think he must have improved on the, the dialogue because they were laughing much more about the with the with the, uh, the subtitles than they were uh, with the, with the dialogue. Right, and I'm sure the majority of people who are seeing the movie probably could follow the movie, or mostly without even subtitles, but uh, less work involved in that way, so they can. Kind yeah, of, but, so they're. More... But now, now yeah. with, with digital projection, you can actually on the same. Uh, you can have the, uh, you know, the, the original version with subtitles and the dub version on the same uh, thing. They could so you can show the the original version in the afternoon and the dub version in the evening. On the, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. But nobody's really dubbing anymore, right? You, you mean just without dubbing subtitles? Dubbing is great. I love yeah. it. <laughs> You're going to start a new trend. Finally, <laughs> dubbing is coming back. I bet they can actually now probably digitally make it look a lot more like people are actually speaking whatever language. Yeah. The whole gamut yeah. of languages. But it's, but it, but it's uh, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you embrace it. Yes. And I often, whenever I can, I go and uh, supervise the dub dub version and they always try to make it as exactly uh, uh, as close as possible to the original but i always say to them no, no let, let's we, let's make another movie here you know we can do mm. all kinds of things <laughs> right. and uh, and yeah. uh, it's fun <laughs> it, it, and especially when, you know you've you finished the film and uh, probably months before and um, you're quite happy to do a kind of remake in italian yes yeah 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 no i understand it <laughs> Like yeah. that, it gives you yeah. sort of like a reboot to your your creative approach to yeah. this movie you've been working on for the last however many years. Yeah, you know. Uh, I was once in Rome doing yes. a, a dub um, of one of my films, Lucio, Lucio, tell your mother you love her. You know, it's that kind of <laughs> there was this little 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 tiny little fat guy sitting in the corner and looking very depressed. And I said, uh, I said what, <laughs> "What's wrong with him?" Yeah. And, and they said, "Well, he he's John Wayne, and John Wayne had just died." Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, he's out of work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of having fun, though, I, I remember when Hope and Glory came out. I was a young guy. I was in my 
probably, I don't know, 87? Did it come out in the States anyway? Yeah. It was 87? I just loved that movie so much, and I, I went back to it uh, a second time alone, and then I started to bring... I saw it three times, I think, at oh, least right. in the movie theater. Well, there was no other option, really. Uh, right. But because... Uh, I just loved it so much. And part of it was, in effect, why it stands out is that I would never have gone to see a war film before where the people seemed to be having so much fun or finding the joy. Mm. And it was just a, such a new way of telling that story. Obviously, it was autobiographical to a great extent. But what inspired you to take that uh, approach to it? It was always uh, such a vivid time as a child, you know. And so I thought, um, you know, I'd tried to make it uh, like seen through the eyes of a seven or eight year old boy and although there were times that were uh, which were you know fearful um, for the most part it was terrific you know often the schools were closed because of bombs dropping and things and so <laughs> so got that's off right. school and yeah. uh, and all the all the fa- fathers were away um, it was a land of women, which I showed in the film. Yes, you and did. men were all off in the army. Women were running things and r- running wild to some extent too, because there was this attitude that <clears throat> we better get on with having some fun because you know we might be dead tomorrow. That was that attitude was around. So um, I thought that had never been depicted on film, and so that's what I try to do. Think they can come over here and take all women? Wasn't that your sister, Rowan? Are you strong enough for another shot? You're going to be a grandma. Hello, grandma! Ah! I think you hit him, grandpa. Huh? He was limping when he ran off. <laughs> And how do you think it came out? Was it a, an authentic version of, of your childhood in the end? Do you feel like that was it? Or well, do you yes, feel it was I, romanticized? Yeah, or? I started off by <laughs> just writing down all the things I could remember, the vivid things I could remember about the time, that mm-hmm. time. And, um, you know, and then I sort of uh, started to dramatize it for, out of that, out of those incidents. Um, and it was, uh, in fact, my... My first title for the film was uh, Shrapnel and Other Fragments. And so, which gives you an idea of how mm, fragmented it was. Um, and shrapnel was, of course, a big thing. The, sure. The, all the, we all had shrapnel collections. Of, so uh, so the, uh, uh, frag, uh, bomb fragments and shell fragments. Yeah. And uh, we used to go out um, in the morning... And often you would pick up a fragment of a, of a bomb and it would be hot. Still hot. Still hot, yeah. And you'd wow. burn your fingers on it. Yeah. Uh, and um, I have one of the best uh, collections. That my, was my next question. <laughs> if, you still had, uh, if you still had the uh, collection of shrapnel? No, I don't. Oh, what no, happened to it? No, I don't have any. Because, uh, you know, eventually, uh, as you saw in the film, yes. our house was destroyed. Oh, right. And uh, uh, my collection of lead soldiers and shrapnel all that. went up in flames, um, as it did everything else. And at yeah. that time, you know, n- not only food was rationed, but also um, clothing was rationed. So we had what we stood up in, and that was it. And it took three months to get uh, emergency clothing uh, coupons oh, so wow so you relied on uh, obviously friends families yeah, uh, donations charity yeah. to the to a great degree at the very beginning and 
there was there was always this these exchanges that you could go to, uh, and particularly with children. So you could take your as your kids got grew up a bit, uh, you took the clothes to the exchange, and you you got some clothes that were a bit bigger, right. and uh, you gave in the ones that you no longer fitted your child, and and mm-hmm. so um, it was. And the, and the curious thing was, it, 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 the, the, I remember what I, the feeling I had as a child when the house was burning we, was that um, I, I felt a feeling of lightness mm-hmm. and that everything, all possessions were gone. And from that moment, I've never owned anything uh, that I couldn't uh, Stand to lose. worry about losing. Mm. And I've never collected anything. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being encouraged to put my archive together. And uh, so I don't have very much, really. I don't, because, you know, they said, well, you know, your scripts would be very important. And I said, well, I throw them away. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Because, wow. I mean, once... Uh, yeah. The script has done its job once you've made the film. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. It's you know. true, but yeah, you don't have that mentality going into no, into all that. So you're not going to be uh, any, you're not going to be on any episode of Hoarders anytime soon. We know that much. You know this uh, these uh, reality TV shows that uh, where people can't even navigate their own homes because they don't throw anything out. Yeah. So it's a big it's a big issue apparently. There. <laughs> So yeah, so the the film also depicts that, and that's liberating. That's got to be liberating, right? Because you're, and also by the way, your films of which I, I mean I, I haven't counted how many features, but there's got to be a good twenty five, I guess you've made. Uh, you, maybe you know the number of feature films you've made. No, about seventeen actually. Okay, so I was a little That'd rather be very lazy. <laughs> it you leave that behind. That's a yeah. lot right there. That's a, quite mm-hmm. a collection that you 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 don't have to, and you don't have to worry about storing it in your. But those, oh, losing it because um, it's out there forever. But it's you know it's it's only rather <clears throat> accidentally is that accidental that films survive. After all, you know ninety percent of the early silent films were all disappeared uh, because at that time, yeah, uh, people didn't think of um, of something to save. You made them, you showed them, you threw them away. Right. Yeah. Um, because it was rather like uh, you know the only. Uh, experience people had before films was the theatre where you put on a play and then everybody went home um, and so this notion of uh, film preservation film preservation is was quite a, a recent recent idea and of course I think there's an awful lot of films that um, don't deserve to be <laughs> preserved <laughs> <laughs> you haven't made any of those so that's nothing to, we have to worry about uh we were talking about uh, Queen and Country, which is also a sequel. Did you specifically want to make something perceived as a sequel, or were you feeling nostalgic and wanted to tell this next chapter? Well, the, the Queen and Country takes place ten years later. No, eight years country. later, really. Eight, because okay. well, by eight. the end of the, the end of uh, the war, really, the boy was like ten years old, mm-hmm. ten years old, and then at eighteen, I had to go in the army. So, yeah. uh, he, so the, you know, after the destruction of our house and the and the Blitz, we'd moved to the river at Shepparton, and and we were living in this kind of dreamlike idyll of life on the river. Yeah. And when eight years later, we find the boy is still there, and he's still in this kind of dream, and and then he's awoken. Uh, rudely by by the nastiness of uh, mm-hmm. the army right a bit of adulthood it sort of snuck up on him right mm. it, the the boy's name is bill is what the boy's name i'm sorry the of hope and glory and now queen and country is it bill yeah it is bill right little bill yes. okay and he's conscripted into the army i guess you could say the, everybody was at yeah. 18 yeah. because at the, you know, see it was only 5 years or so after the war right. <laughs> and um the, and Britain still had garrisons all over the world. It had to be manned. And after the war, all the soldiers were demobbed they were, uh, and, and went back into civilian life. And, the, and they needed people. They needed them. 
um, we there were garrisons in the Suez, in Kenya, in Germany, all over, because, and th what's interesting about that period is that you had this hangover after the war. England was a very bleak kind of place, <clears throat> but the older generation were hanging on to the notions of empire mm -hmm. and uh, imperial Britain. And Britain was the biggest empire ever known. How much of the globe did they have their imprint on? Like it was Two fifths of the Earth's surface was yeah. British. Yeah. And within a few years, mm -hmm. it was all gone. And England became a small island off the coast of Europe. Right. And this was a momentous change, and it was happening. Yeah, and so in the, you know, in the film, you have the young guys who realize that it, it, all that is over, and you have the older ones who are still hanging on to the notion. And so it was a point of tremendous change. Within a few years, the empire was gone. And, and then England changed. When you, a, few, a few years later... You had the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and uh, the uh, art scene, everything completely changed. And then at pop culture-wise, England was, again, two-fifths of the, the globe because of the Beatles the and the Stones. And the swinging 60s. That's we right. We have the swinging 60s and the miniskirt. Look, God, your timing was good, you <laughs> lucky devil. Uh, that's another podcast episode. We're going to have to talk about your life. <laughs> he looks about 30 years younger just talking about uh, yes. the swinging 60s again. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> How much of this uh, had an impact on you? We see in Hope and Glory, Bill is yeah. taking photographs. So already there's an yeah. there's an interest with images. It leads right up to through Queen uh, Country, yeah. well, where by the I, end of that he's a budding filmmaker, right? Yeah. He's, well, I, I think that in that in that bleak time, I think the you know the movies, going to the movies, yeah. and particularly watching American movies was, you know, what kept us going. Um, it was, it was this, America was this incredibly glamorous place. Yeah. And these movies were coming out, and we, and that, we, we hung on to that. And in the film, there are references to the, to the movies that opened at that time, you know, when, during the time when I was in the Army, like Sunset Boulevard. And, right. Uh, so American Strange cinema. Train. So um, you were exporting... Britain was exporting the music at that point. Let's face it; they had the best music coming out of. Or well, this was even before that. You're saying no. We, yes, of course. So that time, that time, you know, this is the in, '40s you're talking about. The, you know, David Lean was uh, was making movies, and Michael Powell, right, um, and they were really uh, part of the, the the change that was happening. And when did you become interested in Hollywood, I guess, and making that transition professionally? Because how many films did you make in, in the U.K. before you went to America and started to work as a director for hire or on your own scripts? So when I came out of the Army mm -hmm. after my two years, and, you know, I wanted to be involved in filmmaking, and I went in, I trained then as a film editor. And... Uh, I I was very happy to I spent my life as a film editor I loved it doing it mm -hmm. and I was making documentaries and cutting them and then uh, you know I was working for the BBC and uh, one day you know someone they asked me to go out and direct one of these documentaries because the director didn't turn up Mm -hmm. So I went out and directed it and, uh, and there you came back and cut it and then I started doing doing that and making b longer and bigger documentaries um, and I was quite happy doing that and you know my whole career is a series of accidents really it's, I didn't even um, I never I never thought I uh, wanted to be a film director in fact my ambition originally was to be a, you know what a clapper loader is oh clapper loader well, is that's I, I, I'm going to screw it up. I, I, I want to say it's the clapboard yeah. guy, but that's not what it yeah, is. Yeah, so he does the clapperboard. Okay, and he also loads the camera. Oh, very good. So he's called. You really clap, are lazy. A clapper loader, and I I thought I thought that was the you know the coolest the job. ultimate ultimate job. I, I could I really 
I p applied mm -hmm. to all the studios to be a clapper loader, and they all, all turned me down. And so I then went in and started editing yeah. and, and working with the BBC. And then I made longer and longer documentaries and um, more ambitious ones, uh, and they sort of had reputation. And then I got bored with the limitations of documentary, and I started to dramatize documentaries. And I started making drama films for the BBC, yeah. for the television. And so my so it, career just kind of grew. Naturally and transitioned. Yeah, and I, I, never, yeah. I, never had this, I never had this idea that one day I'll be a film director. It just happened. Then I started getting offers to direct features. So I Was this around the time of... Um, yeah. And I'm... Yeah, so... Around the time you started uh, to make features, were like the Lindsay Andersons making and yeah. and, and uh, Richard yeah. Uh, yeah. Lester and. But I think the there was a, the it, it, the BBC at that time BBC Television run by a man called Hugh Weldon who was a, a, a mentor to many, uh, including Ken Russell and right. John Schlesinger, and he had this theory that television was mostly repetition. And you needed workhorses to do these weekly programs and things. And then, then you needed events. So we were a group, like I, once I mentioned, uh, who, who were given more resources and time to do bigger projects. And I, so I was chosen as one of those. And uh, there we are. I, you know, it's funny you mentioned the documentaries. Because I was feeling like Open Glory really had a kind of a documentary feel to it, you know, the, the blitz going on behind in the backdrop, and, mm. and it was a uh, was really uh, had a sense of that. Like yes. you know, while we're watching Little Bill and his friends running around yeah. the shell of what was once their their yeah. neighborhood, but me behind them are all these incredible real life events taking place, you know. Yes, and, and so there was that a sense of documentary yes. feel to that, as well as to Queen of Yes, Queen, you know? yes and if you look at some of the other films, it's there too. I, it, did your work in, in documentary did it follow you through into wanting to make films with a social theme to it? One that comes quickly to mind is Leo the Last, which has mm. been one of your lesser known films and now with this uh, wonderful film forum retrospective of course people are maybe a handful of people yes. are, have rediscovered i watched it i had not been familiar i was like this is just an incredible charming film Leo well, the last. Is, you know, I, I, I loved it one of one of the big influences on me was in in london the national film theater opened when i was 17 which was i think um in 1950 i think it was and they showed at that time all the great silent movies. Yes. And I became absolutely besotted with them. And uh, and in, if you mentioned Leo the Last, which where Mastroianni uh, is this privileged fellow living in the big house, and he watches on his um, he watches the, the the slum dwellers in the street, mm -hmm. and through his um, um, binoculars or his telescope and he and so a lot of it is seen through his his, his lens and it's, and it's, uh, and you, his lens, and it's yeah. all silent because you, you can't hear what they're saying or anything and so the whole st story it was I, I was able to use the techniques of silent cinema to, to show to tell story without dialogue right yeah so what's going on is you're with his perspective Right, we're looking through his monocle or whatever yeah. the, the uh, lens of his uh, sight, and then because he can't, we can't hear what's going mm -hmm. on, da uh, you know, down the block what he's looking at That's either. Right. So right, so it is his close. And then you've got Mastriani's face and his yeah. his 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 acting, which is is almost like a silent screen actor, right? Yes. In that same yeah, he's sad, so expressive. Yeah, he's it's a beautiful performance you got from. him. It's a very beautiful performance. Uh, I'm glad to, I, discovered, I finally discovered, had the opportunity to see that film. And it was also, there. I don't think there was a lot of films going on like that at the time, like where, you know, t kind of taking a look at underprivileged, struggling, financially struggling well, it was, at community. That time, in, in the, after the war, a lot of, uh, after the war, a lot of, um, there was a big influx of West Indians coming, came into Britain and they, <clears throat> 
mostly settled up there in, in yes. Notting Hill Gate district of London. And that's where I shot the film. I, I had this possibility that there was a, a whole street that was going to be demolished. Yeah, right. And I was able to take over the whole street and paint it black, paint the street black and the houses black, everything black, and build a facade of a, of a grand house at the end of the street, which, which Mastroianni is. And um, his mansion. And it was um, it was a story of which, in a way, Zardoz was an extension of that story of between you know the how the separation between the rich and the poor, and uh, how the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Chosen ones, the gun is good. The gun is good. Go forth and kill. Who came here in the stone head? I don't know. It is the only path and passage into the vortex. You will show me how you come to be here. Ah! Tell me everything. My name is Zed. Ozandos. I am an exterminator. Tell the um hmm? the story behind the title. It's a it's an interesting uh just a little in, bit of information how you came up with the title for Zardoz. Well, the title is explained in the film, which is, which is that um, um, it's the the brutals on the outside are controlled by this flying head, which is rather like. So Zardoz is this kind of god, right? And uh, he controls these people, and uh, it's based on. So Sean Connery discovers this library, discovers this book, The Wizard of Oz, and he sees it's mm-hmm. no problem. And he sees that um, if you the last wizard, Zard Oz, mm-hmm. Wizard of Oz. And he realizes that they've been tricked, so he figures it out, and that's uh, yeah that, uh, how the title comes from. Because you know, the, like the the um, the figure in Wizard of Oz who, with this big voice, right, frightens people. Yeah, a big head too, yeah. right? Isn't yeah. there like in the Wizard yeah. of Oz within yeah. there a big head? Yeah, it's another little film that people are are rediscovering Zardoz, right? Because it's kind of been not one of your better known films but it seems i see come up there seems to be a lot a, a kind of a following of people who really dig that movie right and was that your first time working with sean connery mm-hmm. it was very good <laughs> <laughs> who can't do a sean connery impression i don't know but i he's fantastic. and you shoot him in that don't do, do you are you is it my mis, am i wrong or is there a moment now see i'm i'm coming like the fan well sean, i'm now just asking you yeah, know fan sh- questions which sean is, had just finished doing the Bond. Right, and he couldn't and, get hired. And no, people didn't want to employ him because he was so associated with the Bond films that they yeah. didn't want to um, you know, hire him really. And so I got him to do this really cheap <laughs> Zardoz. Yeah. Um, oh, I listened to your commentary. I don't know if you remember how much of it. Uh, that's why I was listening to your audio commentary on the DVD. On what? I rent, on Zardoz. I rented it. Uh, and then uh, you, I don't remember doing that. But I <laughs> Yes, I watched it all the way through because I had not seen it also. And then I watched it a second time. You must be thinking, this guy, <laughs> how does he have so much time on things? <laughs> I don't know. But you do the audio commentary by yourself, only you, through the entire thing. And, you know, you kind of just tell anecdotes about the film. Like, for instance, how— talk about the way I got the money? No, I, you probably did. I don't remember. Only certain things that do I remember. But go ahead. How did you get the money? 
well, my agent at the time was David Beagleman. The, yes. He was a great agent. And he was, he was yeah. so sincere that it was almost real. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so <laughs> he said to me, look, you're never going to get the money for this. If it goes through the systems of the studio systems, you know, they're, they're, right. we've, got to, we've got to find a way of doing this. So he go, went to Fox and said, <clears throat> they've just got new management. He said, um, look, here's the deal. You, you send your man over to London. He has two hours to read the script. Mm -hmm. And then it's a yes or no. You have no approvals. And it's a negative pickup. In other words, $1 million annual report. Um, you, Bowman makes the film. You de he delivers you the film. You give him a $1 million. Mm -hmm. That's the deal. Mm -hmm. So the guy comes over. And I was so nervous about it. But David was saying, don't, don't worry. Don't worry. Um, so the guy goes into the office and he has the script there. And they locked him in the office. And he has two hours. And we were waiting outside. We had lunch. And then we came back and we waited outside. And um, the door opens finally. And he's, the guy, he's standing there and he's holding the script. And his hand is shaking. Mm -hmm. And the leaves are fluttering mm -hmm. the script. And he looks wild-eyed, and he's got to make this decision. And David goes up to him and offers his hand and says, congratulations. He never had a chance to say yes or no. David just <laughs> congratulated him, and that was it. <laughs> That's a good that was, approach. That was, uh, some of those agents were great. Yes. Unfortunately, he shot himself. Big David did. Didn't he? Wasn't he a part of that? Uh, he was part of a, a big. Um, he was a big gambler, right? And, and he got he, into debt. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And that that was the cause of it. Because wasn't he also involved in some sort of uh, controversy or at some point? Well, he, 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 like in Hollywood, he, he like ran. The, uh, he he, he ended up being a studio Columbia executive for a bit. And yeah, he, and there was the a scam yeah, or something. He, or something. He, yes, he he wrote wrote checks to himself. I think. Oh, mm. yeah, that'll happen. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> Write that down. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was a book about it, a very famous bestseller, and I'm, I was trying to re trying to remember. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Debs. It was also working with Sean Connery, um, making all sorts of clumsy transitions and connections. But then you did make a bunch of um, a number of very masculine films, and I, I, it's just my way of putting it. Like, um, well. You, 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 maybe I maybe I'm checkerboarding a little you were bit. You're trying to do uh, yeah. an impersonation of Sean Connery. I was trying. I, 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 I said I said to yeah. Sean once. I said I said who um but do you ever think of doing a different accent, you know? He said if I didn't talk the way I talk, I wouldn't know who the hell I am. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh he won the Academy Award Best Supporting Actor in a film where he played an Irish cop with a Scots accent. Mm -hmm. So it's just as well. Apparently, the the Academy voters couldn't tell the difference between a Scots or an Irish accent. Yeah, and you live in Ireland, right? You don't you? Mm? You live in Ireland, right? I do. Yeah. Why Why do you live in Ireland? What was the decision? And how long have you been living in Ireland? Forty five years. On a whim. Kind of thing. No. Yeah. yeah. But no, <laughs> why, well, you were raised obviously in the UK. What, what was the reason you ended up uh, well, living in uh, Ireland? It was an accident, really. I was there doing post production on Leo the Last because there was every, all the post production houses in London were full up. So we went to Ireland and, and um, Ardmore Studios. And it was a beautiful summer. <clears throat> and I thought we might. I had to buy a cottage for holidays, and I loved the landscape. And then one day, I was um, I put I showed this house, and I went to the, it was an auction. And I I wandered into this auction because uh, this house is being auctioned, and, and I, I and I had this out of body experience, and I was kind of looking down 
the auction. There were two people were bidding for it, and one of them appeared to be me. And uh, then people were congratulating me, and I, I bought this, not a cottage, but a big house, you know, and I, I didn't, I hadn't even been inside it. What? I, yeah. Wow. And I didn't know anything about it. And so in the it kind of, I'd spent so much money on it, it became mm-hmm. our, our house by default. And it, 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 I'd been pouring money into it ever since, and... Uh, I'm too poor to leave. I understand. <laughs> We're actually in his uh, foyer at the moment recording this. <laughs> Cause, well, I, I've never been to Ireland myself. I, it's I'll one tell of those places I'm I, dying I, to go to. The great, so now I know where I can it's stay. It's great virtue was for me at the time was it was a long way from Hollywood. Right. Uh, and, you know, I was going crazy there. I'd, um, I loved it, but at the same time, mm-hmm. it was somehow depleting the spirit. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, so, so and that was so. That was around Leo the Last. I don't. I, can't, I, I don't have my I'm filmography always, in front of me. You so. know, I have a little river runs through it, uh-huh. and I've always, you know, had the need to be near a river and in, in amongst trees, and so that's that's why that was. So that you did see from the outside, obviously. So maybe that was. So maybe it reminded and you I, of that house on the Thames. Was it the yes, Thames? Yes, to some uh, extent, uh, uh, it's true. Yeah, maybe. And I, and I and I plant trees. You know, I'm I'm passionate about trees. And in the in the span of forty five years that I've lived there, you know, I've seen trees grow up, and I've outlived some of them. Um, so I live in the span of trees, hmm. um, and that's that suits me very well. You're not going to have anybody arguing about trees. It's not that controversial a subject. So I'm, I'm right there with you. I love trees as well. I do love trees. Do you uh, know, one, yes. one thing, you know, I, I, I know a little bit about them, having studied them for many, many years, okay. is that one of the side effects uh-huh. of uh, pollution and the fact that, that more and more carbon dioxide is put into the air, is trees are growing faster because because trees feed on carbon dioxide right that's what they they're built on carbon dioxide so there's so much more of it around they're shooting up right is that and a then, good thing or a bad another thing, thing <clears throat> you know dutch elm disease mm-hmm. which wiped out all the elms sadly um uh, changed the landscape of uh, britain <clears throat> and the this uh, forester a friend of mine um he planted a lot of elms alongside uh, the motorways. The yeah. And <clears throat> these elms uh, flourished because the pollution coated them and protected them from the disease. Is that right? Yeah. So Why I don't we learn of, from this? I got some of these, I planted them in my, uh, on my grounds, and I don't have any pollution. No. So they died. I understand. Yeah, <laughs> something to be learned from there. It was a ta- one of those ac- happy uh, accidents in a way yes. where, you know, then they can apply it to like the... But strange things happen, you know. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. And But it takes the uh, more evolved sort to figure out, oh, th- this is, let's learn from this and and, and use it, harness it, you know, yeah. for better reason, for better purposes. Um, well, there were a lot of trees in Deliverance. <laughs> That's a terrible <laughs> transition. <laughs> yeah, really. That was about the worst one yet I've ever been. But I, I kind of, you know, I, I definitely can't leave without not talking about the Deliverance and Point Blank and a couple of these other very American films. So these are real Hollywood films, were they? I mean, was or is that well, is that well? Uh, 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 f- f- well, first of all, Deliverance. <clears throat> I never went anywhere near Hollywood with Deliverance. I was already re- already living in Ireland. Okay, right. And I went straight to South Carolina and Georgia to make the film, mm-hmm. and then I went back to Ireland to edit it. And uh, so I bypassed. Yeah. So Hollywood. the money came from Hollywood. Oh, it did. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. but you it didn't came, have. To. It came from Warner's at the time when John Kelly was running things there. And he well, was, you liked him. He was great. He yeah. was great. He never gave me a note. Sat down and chatted about it uh-huh. uh, for a bit. Um, he said, "Okay, go and go and write the script." And I gave him the script. He said, "That seems okay." Yeah. Off you go. Uh, it's very different now. And that was the 
first time working with John Voigt, right, for you and right and Burt Reynolds. Yeah. And uh, and see, I I want to Ronnie have all Cox my notes. Ronnie Cox and, yeah. and what was the and Ned Beatty, of course. Did those, all those guys get along well? Did oh, they? Yeah. Did was yeah. this? Did yeah. they know each other? Uh, maybe. Through Beforehand? The, no, not at all. No, oh, but no, no, that's, no, that was right, a, right. probably to your yeah, advantage. I mean, this, people sometimes ask me, you know, who was the most difficult actor I worked with? Why would they ask that? But go ahead. Who was? I, or what was your answer to that? I've never, never had a, any difficulties with actors. And, you know, if all actors need is they need um, some, they need um, to feel safe, they need to feel... Uh, that um, you're looking after them, and um, <clears throat> and once you, as long as you communicate where what you want and where it's going, um, it's always a, a wonderful a wonderful experience with actors. I always love it. You like them? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do, and I think they're very courageous to stand up in front of a camera and you know express emotion, especially uh, take risks take chances you know a lot of actors will if they're in a situation which is uh, unstable or fractious they will uh, you know they they they'll fall back on what i call defensive acting which is that you say well i know how to get through this scene you know rather than uh, i'm going to i'm going to take risks i'm going to try something you know Mm-hmm. And and no, I've I've had nothing but joy with actors. I mean, Voight. I made two films with Voight, Deliverance and The General. And the General, right? Um, and I've had the privilege of working with actors like Mastroianni and Lee Marvin was, of course, I think the greatest film actor I ever T- worked. With. I'm so glad you brought Lee Marvin up because. For whatever reason, you know, he was just one of those John Wayne types, or this is something I picked up incorrectly. And uh, when I was introduced a number of years ago to Point Blank and watched that, I said, what have I been missing? And then because of the last few weeks I knew that I was sitting with you, I went and I found Hell in the Pacific. Yeah. And I watched that and I was like, Why, how, how is it possible I have not seen this film before? It was amazing. I said, this is such a great, Lee Marvin is such a great actor. Why did I... Not reject him, but I, I, I kind of just uh, yeah. reduced his his whole style. But I was I was really wrong. Well, we were talking about silent films, and when I made Helen Pacific about these two men, Lee Marvin and Toshiro Mifune, uh, you know, uh, uh, on this tiny island, washed up on this tiny island, uh, without a, a common language, and this was mm-hmm. like making a silent movie. I mean, you had sound effects, and of course they they shouted and did things, but but fundamentally it was a silent movie, mm-hmm. and I was able to draw on my all my experience of uh, watching and studying silent films mm-hmm. in making that one. Yeah, that's true. There was another silent film. Very true. That's a great uh, pairing. Obviously, you're the final decider of of casting in your films. I'm assuming in almost every case, but. Did you just see those two actors together, that they would uh, have a great rapport and great chemistry, Mifume and, well, this is, and Lee Marvin? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the, or, there was a short story it was based on, um, and Lee was very anxious to work with Mifune. He admired him enormously. Oh, really? Okay. And they got on very well. And unfortunately, I didn't get on very well with Mifune. Uh, um, we... Uh, it was a long story. I don't want to go into it. It's too <laughs> painful. Hmm. But <laughs> Interesting. it was it was tough. But he was wrong, and you were right. That much you can say. No, well, it was it was <laughs> what it what it was. I I when I was writing the script, I had two writers: an American writer and a, a Japanese writer called Shobu Hashimoto, who was, worked a lot with Kurosawa. And he, he um, at one point. He was a gambler, and he wanted to go off to Vegas. Uh, and he said, could he go off and do a draft on his own? And he went off, and he did his drafts. And he didn't alter any of the scenes at all. He just altered the character of Mifune, and he made him into a kind of uh, a buffoon, rather like it was okay. in the Seven Samurai. And, you know, we translated it, and I said, oh, no, that's not. 
that's completely out wrong. And whether malignantly or accidentally, he gave that version to Mifune. So when we started oh. shooting, uh, I had a Japanese crew, and I had to constantly correct Mifune, which was a loss, huge loss of face for him to be correct in front of his in front of the crew, mm. and that he was doing wrong. And he, he refused to change. You know, he just kept doing it the same way. He didn't I asked him to change? He, mm -hmm. he, he wouldn't. And I had to stop shooting, go back to the ship. We were living on a ship, and argue for hours. And it went on it, all like that. It doesn't show in the film. It's a really um, well, it, what, what, you know, eventually got, got behind and the producers turned up and uh, I had uh, an accident on the reef and I got a, a coral poisoning in my knee and oh dear. I was in fever and I couldn't work. And so they went to Mifuni and said, um, you'll pl be pleased to hear that we're going to replace Borman because, you know, he's sick and you don't get on and you're getting far behind. So we're going to going to replace him. And Mifuni said, I couldn't agree to that. Why not? He said, because um, I, we went to the tea house in Tokyo and I agreed to do the film with him. It's a matter of honor. And the producer said to him, hey, listen, this is Hollywood. Honor doesn't come into it. <laughs> Just ask David Bagelman. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. he, he wouldn't budge. <laughs> so, so there's that. I went so back and I thought, now we're going to be pals, you know. But it went right, on no. exactly the same way. With Understood. The, same. the yeah. argument just continued yeah. on. Right. And the only, the only codicil to this story was that he opened a restaurant in um, in Munich called Mifuni. And you might imagine it was also a Japanese restaurant. And I went in there with two or three people to have dinner. And when it, I asked for the check, they said there's no charge. Because Mifuni had left a, a, a list of people, if they came in, <laughs> they didn't have to pay. Which I interpret as, as a kind of apology. <laughs> That's a good way to interpret that. Oh, Has I, this got anything to do with anything? Is yeah, this all? This is okay? this is exactly. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely, John. Because uh, I think a lot of people, well, that I think the people that listen to this thing that I do are really interested in both what goes on behind, yeah, your, what 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 you are, what's going on in your mind and your mm -hmm. and, and how your your journey on a, on a very practical level because they can learn from that because a lot of mm -hmm. filmmakers I think listen to the show, but on the other hand, they also I think are geeks, you know, like nerds around actors and filmmakers and things like mm. that. So those types of stories are really... Well, you're, you must you know, know you're that, You're asking though. about actors. And, and, and yeah. This, uh, um, I would, someone asked me the other day about Zardoz. How did you persuade Sean Connery to wear a wedding dress <laughs> right. in the film? Right. And uh, then someone said to me, well, how did you persuade those actors in Deliverance to, to go down those cataracts and rapids? And, and I said, well, it's, it's very easy. What you do is you say to the actors, um, right, you see that uh, those rapids there? You get into the canoes and you go down. And you make it sound as though it's the most ordinary thing in the world. You know? <laughs> and, and so I say, uh, Sean, in this scene you wear a wedding dress, okay? It's over here. Uh, go and put it on. Um, Brooks, no argument, you know. <laughs> I walk away, and he's left there with a, a dresser holding up a wedding dress. You know? <laughs> uh, and he should be lucky because some of the, a lot of those extras they had things their 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 leggings and stuff sprayed on, right? Because yeah. you you said because the budget was so wasn't great. Let's put it that way. It wasn't a huge budget no, on that film. So. And, and of course, Sean, a little bit you know, of video Sean is, a, is the more. archetypal tight Scotsman. You right, know, of off. course. He, he came, he, when we started the film, he came to me and said, uh, John, uh, in my contract, I've got a car and a driver, right? And I said, yeah. He said, I'll drive myself and I'll split it with you. <laughs> 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 and he, he was... 
if you only knew what. And, he, and then he stayed yeah. in my house, you know, and um, he stayed in my house, and uh, he he, um, he and while we were preparing the film, and so I said, "Well, you know, you're comfortable here. You might as well just stay on while you're shoot while we're shooting." And he said, uh, "If if I do that, I'll pay my way." All right, so. At the end of the week, he gives my wife a, an envelope with seven pounds in it. Um, uh, now, you know, he was he was drinking, you know, a couple of bottles of scotch uh, every week alone, you know, which was, I mean, uh, and I, seven pounds was apparently what he would pay when he was on the touring uh, company of... Um, South Pacific. Seven pounds was only paid uh, to a landlady for his room, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what his idea of rent was. Uh, he's he had a sense of humor, Connery. Obviously, he liked he liked to have fun. Yeah, yeah. So Queen of Country is again. We're going to week two of Queen of Country, which is your your newest film, and and potentially is this you you, you don't have plans to make more. I, I don't want to get into this territory necessarily, but uh, it's, it's well. I I, I, <clears throat> I announced uh, this is my last film, and I the last shot of the film is of a you know a, a, an amateur camera wind up that um, mm -hmm. stops, and that was my uh, little metaphor for ending at the end of my career. Um, so. But I'm in, being encouraged to do another one. I don't know whether I will. All right. No. It's, um, you know. No pressure. Clint Eastwood is um, three years older than me. And I was I I thought I did. And well. made his biggest successful film this year. I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I I hated it. Anyway. I'm trying to get him on the show, so easy does it. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I, I, I certainly understand. I mean, you've done your bit. But, you know, nobody wants to hear that you're retiring. But, you know, it, you've certainly done more than your share of making some wonderful films. And several of them are among my favorites. And, and, and I've added a couple more since uh, uh, preparing, you know. Um, so thanks so much. And uh, I appreciate your, your sitting with me. Thank it's you. It's good Tom. talking to you. Thank you. Uh, can, can I, can I get, ask you to do... Um, one thing, and you're not required to do this, but one of the things is I put in the show is is I, I ask mm. like the, sometimes the guest to say, "This is John Borman." Mm. They all say, "I'm John Borman." It's funny. No, they, they and ask them to say, "This is John Borman, the director of a Queen and Country, and whatever." And I, you're listening to, and then my show, which I can write down. So it's it's. Do you mind doing that? So you like me? It's to like do prostituting it. yourself for a sec. You just basically it's like an ID thing for my show, and I can put it in mm. once in a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, film Wax yeah, film Radio. Wax. So you just say, this is John Borman. I should have wrote, written this down beforehand. It's, uh, okay. The name of the show is Film Wax, like waxing. Film wax. Philo yeah, like waxing philosophical. That, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> that was where it came from. This is John Borman. Um, I made uh, Queen and Country, which is playing now. And I'm very glad to be appearing on Film Wax Radio. Great. Thank you. Perfect. One take wonder. All right. That's great. And then I guess, and then I have uh, the, the uh, course. You know, there's one thing that, get, you know, uh, yes. is, I, know I, I think it may be pedantic, but. By all means. People always talk about the radio <coughs> program as their show, whereas the show is the one thing you can't do in radio. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Now I have to redo. So can you do? You have to do another one. <laughs> no, we didn't say. We didn't say show. I don't think. So, can, so I have, and then I'm going to clear out. Yeah, no, but, I'm, I'm but can we? Good. Right. I have a copy of Point Blank. For if you could, do you, do you mind signing it? Like I have of a copy course, of. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So the, in there is a Point Blank and also a marker. Of the, um, do you need a sharpie? I have one. Oh, I, great. I, I was mostly Got prepared it. today. Prepared. Great. Yeah. Oh, great. I, right. Yeah. See that. I, yeah, because I think it's moved to the top of my current favorites. I think yeah, that, that, maybe just a picture. Just uh, I don't know your camera is. I'm putting this up by Monday. 
Great. Because I want to take advantage of week two of film at the film forum. Fantastic. And you also linked it as film forum. There it is. Is that what you meant? Yes. Okay. You can ask me. I'll do it. Yeah, I would anyway. 